This is the first in a series of videos I'm making on the Odes of John Keats, working from this excellent book by literary critic Helen Vendler. Keats is one of my all-time favorite poets, and I've adored the Odes since I discovered his poetry as a teenager. To start, I'll give a very brief overview of his life. John Keats was born in London in 1795. His father died when he was eight. His mother died when he was 14. The same year his mother died, Keats took up a surgeon's apprenticeship. In 1815, aged about 20, he finished his apprenticeship and began his formal medical studies. Meanwhile, he had been nursing a deep passion for poetry. His earliest surviving poem is from 1814. His first poem to be published was published in 1816. From that time on, he poured his best energies into his poetry and aspired to become a great poet. In 1818, he nursed his brother Tom on his deathbed. Tom would die of tuberculosis at the end of the year. That same year, he fell in love with a girl named Fanny Braun, to whom he wrote his wonderful Bright Star Sonnet. Though they had become engaged, they were never to be married. Keats began to develop similar symptoms to what his brother had, coughing up blood at the start of 1820. He sailed to Italy that same year in the hopes that a warmer climate would improve his condition. However, his health continued to deteriorate, and he died in Rome in February 1821 at the young age of 25. Generally disregarded as a poet in his lifetime, he was soon considered one of the leading poets of the Romantic movement and one of the greatest poets in the English language. The six great odes of John Keats were all composed in the year 1819, just a couple of years before he died, but before his ill health was severe. The odes are generally considered to be his finest masterpieces. In this series, I will devote a video to each of the odes, in the order Helen Vendler believes they were conceived or written. The actual order of composition is debated, but Vendler believes there is a certain essential progression from one ode to the next, as we'll come to see. Everything I say about the odes in these videos will be from her book, unless I state otherwise. If I give my own view, I'll make it clear that it's mine. In each video, I'll first read out the poem, and then give a summary of Vendler's analysis. There are many particular details I'll have to miss out in the interests of time, but if you're intrigued, I'd recommend getting the book. The version I'm using, and which the page numbers will be from, is the original edition published in 1983. By the way, that Greek vase or urn on the screen is a sketch by Keats himself. Something like it will feature in a couple of the odes, most famously the Ode on a Grecian Urn, but also in this one, in which the three figures that interrupt Keats' indolence are said to pass in return like the images on a marble urn being turned around. And just before I begin... A brief note on the order of the stanzas. There are a couple of different versions of this ode out there, in which the third, fourth, and fifth stanzas are arranged differently. Venla believes the version presented here is the correct one. The poem was published after Keats' death, and it appears that the person who made the first copy, working from loose sheets of Keats' original, copied them in the wrong order first, before subsequently correcting his mistake, but Vendler notes that this confusion could only have occurred because the poem is peculiarly static, and as we'll see, appears to make no progress at all. Here is the poem. It opens with an epigraph from the Bible. They toil not, neither do they spin. We'll touch on that later. 
Now, the poem itself. One morn before me were three figures seen, with bowed necks and joined hands side-faced, and one behind the other stepped serene in placid sandals and in white robes graced. They passed like figures on a marble urn when shifted round to see the other side. They came again, as when the urn once more is shifted round, the first seen shades return. And they were strange to me, as may betide with vases to one deep in Phidian lore. How is it shadows, that I knew ye not? How came ye muffled in so hush a mask? Was it a silent, deep disguised plot to steal away and leave without a task my idle days? Ripe was the drowsy hour, the blissful cloud of summer indolence benumbed my eyes, my pulse grew less and less. Pain had no sting, and pleasure's wreath no flower. Oh, why did ye not melt, and leave my sense unhaunted quite of all but nothingness? A third time passed they by, and passing turned each one the face a moment whiles to me, then faded, and to follow them I burned and ached for wings, because I knew the three. The first was a fair maid, and love her name. The second was ambition, pale of cheek and ever watchful with fatigued eye. The last, whom I love more, the more of blame is heaped upon her, maiden most unmeek, I knew to be my demon, poesy. They faded, and forsooth I wanted wings. O oh, folly! What is love, and where is it? And for that poor ambition, it springs from a man's little heart's short fever fit. For poesy, no, she has not a joy, at least for me, so sweet as drowsy noons, and evenings steeped in honeyed indolence. Oh, for an age sh so sheltered from annoy, that I may never know how change the moons, or hear the voice of busy common sense. A third time came they by, alas, wherefore, my sleep had been embroidered with dim dreams, my soul had been a lawn, besprinkled o'er with flowers and stirring shades and baffled beams. The morn was clouded, but no shower fell, though in her lids hung the sweet tears of May. The open casement pressed a new-leaved vine, let in the budding warmth, and throstles lay. O oh, shadows, t'was a time to bid farewell, upon your skirts had fallen no tears of mine. So ye three ghosts adieu, ye cannot raise my head cool bedded in the flowery grass, for I would not be dieted with praise, a pet lamb in a sentimental farce. Fade softly from my eyes, and be once more in mask-like figures on the dreamy urn. Farewell, I yet have visions for the night, and for the day faint visions there is store. Vanish ye phantoms from my idle sprite into the clouds and never more return. Venla begins her analysis by noting that this is the seminal poem for all the other odes, following the critic Bernard Blackstone. She believes that it may have been written down as late as May 1819, though its origins are clearly earlier. In the entry, dated 19th March, of the long journal letter sent to his brother George, Keats made the following remarks. This morning I am in a sort of temper, indolent and supremely careless. I long after a stanza or two of Thompson's Castle of Indolence. My passions are all asleep, from my having slumbered till nearly eleven, and weakened the animal fibre all over me, 
to a delightful sensation about three degrees on this side of faintness. If I had teeth of pearl and the breath of lilies, I should call it languor. But as I am, I must call it laziness. In this state of effeminacy, the fibres of the brain are relaxed in common with the rest of the body, and to such a happy degree that pleasure has no show of enticement, and pain no unbearable power. Neither poetry, nor ambition, nor love have any alertness of countenance as they pass by me. They seem rather like figures on a Greek vase, a man and two women, whom no one but myself could distinguish in their disguisement. This is the only happiness, and is a rare instance of the advantage of the body overpowering the mind. This is clearly the experience that led to the later creation of the Ode on Indolence. We can see here an ambivalence that will become apparent in the poem. Is this experience good or bad? It is a delightful sensation, happiness, an advantage, and yet is also a kind of effeminacy and laziness. This is a poem of gestation, of preparation, of potential, and thus it is appropriate that it was the first ode to be conceived. The three figures, love, ambition, poesy, beckon Keats to action, yet he does not rise. Yet he does not simply ignore them either. He is pulled into relationship with them. As Wendler notes, the poem is a dialogue of the embryonic, unformed, languorous, dreaming, poetic self with its later envisaged incarnation in accomplished form. The marble urn with its figures represents the accomplished work of art, the definite, the permanent, and calls the poet to this achievement. But this aspect of the poem interacts with the poet's changeful, subjective state of indolence, unrealized, yet full of potential. This can be seen not only in the particular language or symbolism used, but in the overall structure of the poem. According to Wendler, each ode has a structural shape, a pattern that unites it. The ode on indolence has two of these. The first is vacillation, the continual shifts of Keats' mood, and his changing relationship to the figures. Here the difference is in the following. Was it a silent, deep, disguised plot to steal away and leave without a task my idle days? Oh, why did ye not melt and leave my sense unhaunted quite of all but nothingness? To follow them I burned and ached for wings because I knew the three. Adieu, ye cannot raise my head, cool bedded in the flowery grass. This is the ry rhythm of will. Keats' mood shifts throughout the poem. As Wendler says, from languor to yearning, from self-reproach to self-indulgence. And his relation to the figures changes, ranging from desire to refusal, from accusation that they will secretly leave him to commanding them to leave. The second structural shape is the steady recurrence of the figures themselves. They passed like figures on a marble urn. They came again as when the urn once more is shifted round. A third time passed they by. A third time came they by. Prompted by Harold Bloom, Wendler notes that the three figures can be seen as Keats' three fates, like the three figures from Greek mythology who are in charge of everyone's destiny. The silent but steady appearance and reappearance of the figures is the rhythm of fate, Keats' poetic destiny, which he ultimately cannot resist, try as he might. Though these two structures or rhythms are intention, vacillation and recurrence, will and fate, it is the steady recurrence of fate 
that ultimately prevails. Not in the poem itself, we leave it with the poet refusing to move and still trying to banish the figures, but we know it is the victor because of what comes next. Keats' activity in creating all the odes. And the victory is presaged by the majestic opening of the poem. One morn before me with three figures seen. This is, Vendler says, the inexplicable prior and beautiful appearance of the rhythm of fate. It comes first before the indolent Keats has a chance, chance to express himself, and this itself establishes its dominance. Let's look at the figures themselves. Keats, of course, names them in the poem. The first was a fair maid, and love her name. The second was ambition, pale of cheek, and ever watchful with fatigued eye. The last whom I love more, the more of blame is heaped upon her, Maiden most unmeek, I knew to be my demon, poesy. Love, ambition, and poesy, or poetry, these are Keats' fates. They are linked. Love is the subject of poetry, and ambition its motive. In one sense, this is Keats as poet, externalized. In another sense, this is the artwork, the objective artifact, the poems that Keats should be making. There is a high kind of haunting going on, a continual return, a haunting of Keats by his own talent and nature, a haunting by his vocation and future possibilities. The poet is affected by the figures, however much he sometimes wishes he wasn't, but the figures are not affected by him. As Wendler says, the urn double is unaffected by the expostulations of the protesting speaker. Its figures return ever the same, ever poised, rhythmic, imperturbable, pregnant with meaning, placid, serene. I mentioned before that Keats' letter, in which he recounts the um, experience that led to this poem, his letter shows the ambivalence he felt about the state. This ambivalence runs through the poem. The initial epitaph comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And that's from Matthew, chapter 6, verse 28. Jesus is saying, don't worry about clothing. Look how beautiful the lilies are, yet they do not work at all. Implicitly, Keats is comparing himself to a lily of the field. He is rejecting the voice of busy common sense and instead embracing simplicity. He is in the right here, in fact, religiously justified, and yet he longs to follow the figures that appear to him, and acknowledges in the closing lines he has an idle sprite, an idle, a lazy spirit. Though at times the figures are annoyances to be banished, at other times they are hushed fugitives, stealing away from him, though desperately needed. There are three different Keatses represented in the poem, with three different forms of speech. Two of these are indolent, and one is ambitious. The language of the indolent passages takes two forms. One is the language of death, of numbness, insensibility, dissolution. This is language we will see in the later Ode to a Nightingale. For example, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk, and now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain. In the present poem we hear it in the lines, 
The blissful cloud of summer indolence benumbed my eyes. My pulse grew less and less. Pain had no sting and pleasure's wreath no flower. Although, as we will see, that's not all that's going on in these lines. Now, the second kind of language used for the indolence, indolent Keats is quite different. It is a language of birth. We hear it in such lines as these. My soul had been a lawn besprinkled o'er with flowers and stirring shades and baffled beams. And the open casement pressed a new-leaved vine let in the budding warmth and throstles lay. This is a language of rich dreams, growing flowers, budding warmth, open casements. This is a creative, gestating indolence, full of promise, not an indolence of oblivion. It uses the language of the next ode to Psyche. For example, they lay calm breathing on the bedded grass, their arms embraced and their pinions too, their lips touched not but had not bade adieu, as if disjoined by soft-handed slumber, and ready still past kisses to outnumber. The third Keats is the ambitious lover and aspiring poet. Wendler isn't explicit about when his voice appears, Perhaps we hear it in, the f in his first response to recognizing the figures. To follow them I burned and ached for wings because I knew the three. Perhaps it is in the lines that present the figures themselves, in their silent majesty and fateful recurrence. In either case, this language isn't as developed as the language of Keats's indolent selves. He had not yet found the language to express this part of himself with brilliance, adequacy, and ease. You can see this, I think, if you compare the opening appearance of the three figures with the creative reverie, the stirring shades and baffled beams of the third stanza. The latter excels the former in poetic richness and power. If we look at the third stanza in particular, we see that Keats' most powerful feelings in March 1819 when he wrote the passage quoted from his letter were, as Wendler puts it, rapturous sensations both mental and physical which took the form of sensing things beginning and about to happen, flowers budding, shades stirring, sunbeams seeking a path, tears about to fall, opening windows Bare vines growing green, warmth, birdsong, the vague shapes of night visions, and waking dreams in daytime. However, there was more going on, because we also have the death-inflected nightingale language. As Wendler puts it, an unwillingness to feel such new stirrings, a wish to sink into insensibility. And she notes the most obvious motive for this. His brother Tom had died a few months earlier, in December 1818, probably of tuberculosis. John Keats nursed him in his illness, and it's possible this is when he caught the disease that would end his own life a few years later. So here we have ambition and two forms of indolence the ambition to pursue his poetic calling, the indolence that is close to despair and exhausted shrinking from all further experience, and finally, the indolence of necessary gestation, holding off for now from creation so that all the new ideas that are germinating inside him have time to grow. As Wendler puts it, an inchoate, if deeply felt, need for a longer time of budding and ripening. This is the gestation for all the great poetry Keats would produce in the short time remaining to him, including all the other odes, culminating in the ode to Autumn. When Keats asks the figures, how is it, shadows, 
that I knew ye not. Wendler calls this the poem's most memorable moment. When he asks this, it's clear that he does not know his own soul. In his indolence, with its twin motives, he has lost sight of his ambitious self, which he projects externally as the figures of the urn. Wendler says, He has not known them because he did not wish to know them. In his realization, we see a flash of that ambitious Keats, a desire to catch them, an accusation they were plotting to steal away from him. This is one of many swings in mood in the poem, as Keats vacillates between different relations to the figures, but also between different modes of narration. Sometimes he is talking about them in the past tense, sometimes talking to them in the present tense sometimes offering a sarcastic aside, oh folly, what is love and where is it? Some of these are more successful than others. The sarcastic asides, for instance, Wendler finds to be a bit of a failure. They may work for Byron, but don't quite work for Keats. The most successful language is that used to describe his private scene of indolence, and I would say especially the creative birth-inflected aspects of it, Though the will for future accomplishment is also authentically his, he has not yet developed a language suitable to it. As I mentioned, the language used for the figures or apparitions just cannot rival the luxuriant language of the indolent stanza of stirring shades and baffled beams. We can actually isolate a transition between these two kinds of language. The poem opens with a stately pentameter describing the appearance of the figures, and this continues largely into the beginning of the second stanza, How is it, shadows, that I knew ye not? But this stateliness is suddenly and pleasantly broken in the midst of the fifth line. Listen. Was it a silent, deep, disguised plot to steal away and leave without a task my idle days, ripe was the drowsy hour, the blissful cloud of summer indolence benumbed my eyes, my pulse grew less and less, pain had no sting, and pleasure's wreath no flower. That word ripe disrupts the line and alters the meter in what Wendler calls technically a medial trochaic inversion. In other words, we go from da-da, da-da, to da-da. My idle days, ripe was the drowsy hour. It's like the new thought, the new language of indolence is breaking in on the steady, stately recurrence of the figures. And this other language, this la indolence language, has a life and spontaneity that is lacking in the other, it is not entirely regular, and this waywardness of rhythm begins to please the ear. It leads into the first private scene of indolence. This is where the death-inflected nightingale language is more on display, and yet it is continually undermined with the sensual psyche language of new birth. Wendler says... Keats's language for the negation of sense in sleep is fatally contaminated here with the luxuriousness of sense. It is far from the withered sedge and from places where no birds sing. Wendler is here referring to his poem La Belle Dame Sans Merci, in which a sense of lonely barrenness is conjured by language equally sparse. The sedge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing. But consider the passage I read just before, and how different it is. The language is sensual, not sparse at all. It works against itself, right from the opening word ripe, hardly a metaphor for oblivion. His eyes are benumbed, but by what? A blissful cloud. His pulse doesn't simply lessen, but grows less and less. 
In that string of potent sensuous words, pain, sting, pleasure's wreath, flower, the effect of this is hardly tempered by the two little no's in their midst. As I've mentioned, I think the third stanza where the psyche language of birth clearly dominates is the most successful in the poem. This is a delicious stanza, full of sweet stirrings and premonitions, and uses a style Keats has developed almost to perfection. In the final stanza, we can see all the various modes of speech that Keats has developed in the poem jostling with each other. We see the invocational, so ye three ghosts adieu, the indolent recreative, my head cool bedded in the flowery grass, the ironic hostile, a pet lamb in a sentimental farce, the descriptive narrative, mask-like figures on the dreamy urn, the depreciation of sensation, my idle sprite, and the as yet discarnate stirrings of the will, I yet have visions for the night, and for the day faint visions there is store. Here the vacillation of the poet's will reaches a crescendo. On the surface it seems like his idle will has won. After all, he ends by commanding these figures of destiny to vanish and never return, and yet that he needs to bid them for what needs to bid farewell to them again and again, tells against this conclusion. We will return to this in a minute. The figures evolve throughout the poem, at least in the way the poet takes them. At first they are the graceful unknown visitors of the opening stanza. Then they suddenly become something like theatrical muffled plotters against him. These phrases are venless. Next they become repro reproachful revenants, ghosts haunting him like the ghost of Hamlet's father returning to spur his indolent son to action. Then they are moral emblems of duty or desire, the fair maid love, ambition pale of cheek. Ambition, by the way, is probably to be pictured as male, if we are to go by the description in Keats's letter. And finally, they are deities, the gods who preside over the ode. Wendler notes, the elevated state dictates Keats's elevated language of address, and that each time he directly addresses them, the temperature of the poem rises in what we may call odal fire a very different temperature from the incubating vernal warmth of the recreative stanzas. Despite Keats' indolence, he is forcefully drawn into relation with the figures again and again, and, and what is especially telling is that he has to say goodbye to them again and again. O oh, shadows, t'was a time to bid farewell, so ye three ghosts adieu, Fade softly from my eyes. Farewell, I yet have visions. Vanish, ye phantoms. This puts him in the role of a kind of magus, attempting to summon and banish spirits, a role already much more engaged and active than mere indolence. Venler says, he begins to command his spiritual world even in attempting to refuse it. Though the result of the poem appears to be a stalemate, the figures in fact silently prevail because they draw him into this activity, ultimately into the very crafting of this poem. As Wendler remarks, quoting a phrase from The Ode on a Grecian Urn, the budding warmth of spiritual sensuality refuses to the end the cold pastoral of art, but the very insistence of the pressure towards figuration makes the shape of the dispute seem a disingenuous one. The figures also silently prevail because he cannot banish them. One is not convinced, despite his forcefulness, 
that at the end they are truly gone. It would be very easy to imagine an additional stanza beginning, they came again, or a fourth time passed they by. They would do so with the same imperturbable stateliness. Keats can delay, but cannot resist his fate. The next ode to Psyche represents the first decisive step beyond indolent reverie into structured creation, into art, though a peculiarly internal kind of art, a pre-art of imagination. <laughs> 